gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Beach Energy Limited FY20 Half Year Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I now ask hand the conference over to your first speaker today, Mr. Matt Kay. Thank you, sir. Please go ahead. Hello and welcome to the FY20 Half Year Results Presentation for Beach. My name's Matt Kay, I'm the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer. As you know, joining me on the call today is Mornay Engelbrecht, our Chief Financial Officer. We also have a number of executives in the room who are able to answer questions later on. So the format of today's presentation is we'll run you through the results presentation. And at the end, we'll open up the lines for Q&A. So let's move to the presentation. Slide two includes our disclaimer, which also includes oil price and forex assumptions used in our FY20 guidance, as well as reserves disclosure. If you move to slide three, Beach is more than halfway through its most ambitious and exciting year of organic growth in the company's history. In August last year, we outlined our biggest ever drilling program, which would see Beach participate in wells in the Perth Basin, Otway Basin, and of course the Cooper Basin. Since that time, we've also added the Great South Basin in New Zealand by the farm in to the large Tafaki Prospect, which is currently drilling. Our aim, as always, is to unlock the value of our assets and increase shareholder value. We do this by strategic and targeted investments in basins with a proven track record and excellent growth potential. To ensure our investment program presents a value proposition for our shareholders, we maintain a razor sharp focus on execution. I'm pleased to report to you today that the execution of our record investment program is going extremely well. We completed 105 wells in the first half with an 83% success rate. Western flank oil output has ramped up as forecast and we're now producing above 22,000 barrels of oil per day from our operated assets. That success means we need to invest more in our infrastructure and we'll talk about that a little later. The Victorian Otway Basin, as you know, is a key growth asset for Beach and we've kicked off the journey, the first of 11 planned wells to refill the Otway gas plant. Blackwatch 1 is currently drilling and we should hit total depth in about three weeks. The Oceanonics semi-submersible rig is also scheduled to arrive next month after completing refurbishment activities and it will begin by drilling the Artisan 1 exploration well. On the exploration and appraisal front, we announced a number of key successes in the first half, including field extensions in the prolific Bower oil field an overall Cooper Basin exploration and appraisal success rate of 66%. A material gas discovery at the Hara Springs Deep in the Perth Basin in the same King, uh, excuse me, Kingia formation as a nearby Wait Deer gas field. And a further gas discovery in our South Australian Otway acreage at Dombey One. We are strongly encouraged by these results. and We've moved quickly to progress plans for further exploration and appraisal in the Perth Basin and the SA Otway, including contracting the Eastern Well 106 rig. In short, drilling success is breeding more opportunities to reinvest our capital. On the operations front, I'm very pleased to say our operations team has done a stellar job in the first half, with facility reliability averaging above 98% across all of our assets. The standout for me in the first half is the successful shutdown of our coupe asset in New Zealand. That means a major shutdown that was performed on time, on budget, with no recordable safety incidents. That's the first major shutdown performed by Beach since the latest acquisition. High facility reliability helped Beach achieve first half production of 13 million barrels of oil equivalent, with oil production on track to hit our initial guidance range of 8.7 to 9.2 million barrels for the year. I won't steal too much of Mornay's thunder, but I'm pleased to report we generated underlying EBITDA of $622 million in the first half 
and underlying net profit after tax was $274 million. The 2% decline in underlying NPAT is an excellent result given it includes the impact of the sale of 40% stake in the Otway Basin. On a pro forma basis, our first half in underlying NPAT was 9% higher than the prior corresponding period. Our interim dividend of one cent per share is unchanged on the prior period as we continue to prioritise total shareholder returns through value accretive investment. Let's go to slide four. It outlines our safety performance. As we've said many times, safety is always our primary focus within Beach and it drives our behaviours at all levels across the business. From a safety performance perspective, there was an increase in minor injuries such as trips and sprains reported in the first half of FY20. As a result, a comprehensive review of common causal factors has been completed and appropriate actions have been implemented. We continue to work closely with our workforce and our contractors to ensure all activities are completed safely. We've had another very good half year from an environmental performance and process safety perspective, with only minor loss of containment events being recorded. Total crude spilled is lower than last year and is comprised of a low number of minor spills. Go to slide five. Our operational excellence program continues to deliver results as is evident in our field operating costs, which have continued to trend downwards in the first half of FY20 to now reach $9.10 per Bowie. As I mentioned earlier, the coupe shutdown was completed on time, on budget, and with no HSD incidents. That's an excellent outcome by the team. And importantly, facility reliability returned to pre-shutdown levels soon after restart. Our facilities achieved an average reliability of over 98% in the first half. And we're targeting to maintain or increase our reliability levels over the remainder of FY20. Our operations team continue to work on optimising our activities to minimise production interruptions. In the past few months, our Victorian operations team completed the engineering and regulatory work required to shift some of our Otway gas plant shutdown activities to later in the calendar year. That nets an overall reduction of five to six days and saves around $4 million. As you know, we have a targeted $30 million reduction in direct controllable operating costs by the end of FY20. And we're tracking really well, reaching 28 million of sustainable annual cost savings by the end of the first half. On slide six, before I hand over to Mornay, I wanted to touch on our East Coast gas portfolio. This is an area, as you know, of considerable debate amongst investors and analysts, and in particular, the subject of the recent reduction in spot prices and how that may impact Beach. I won't be able to answer all your questions on this subject because of confidentiality clauses under our gas contract. However, what I can say is we, like everyone else, have seen an increase in the availability of low price spot gas over the past six months coinciding with a decline in spot LNG prices. Most of this gas, of course, is available for sale in Queensland. So movement of the gas to southern markets, where beach operates, requires transportation through the pipeline network. So this begs the question of how much gas beach sells into that spot gas market. And the answer is very little. Almost all of beach's gas is contracted under multi-year gas sales agreements that have no pricing linkage to the spot market. In the first half of FY20, less than 1% of Beach's East Coast gas sales were sold into the spot. Over the remainder of FY20 and through FY21, we expect spot sales to remain below 3% of our East Coast portfolio volumes. We've contracted additional volumes in recent months, including our equity share of BAS gas volumes over calendar 2020 and 2021 and 94% of Western Flank volumes over the same period. As you know, we have a large number of gas sales agreements with Origin Energy, associated with the assets we acquired as part of the latest acquisition more than two years ago. Some of these contracts have repricing clauses, and the first of these, associated with Victorian Otway, is up for repricing from 1 July 2020. The repricing process with Origin in relation to this contract has now commenced. 
As most of you would know, generically, pricing events and repricing events in Australian domestic gas contracts refer broadly to similar contracts in the same market. So I won't comment on individual contracts we have other than to state the obvious. They are typical Australian domestic gas contracts. As a reminder of the process, if both parties cannot agree on an outcome, then it moves to arbitration. With the final price backdated, in this case, to 1 July 2020, if the outcome occurs after that date. I will now hand over to Mornay to run through our financial results in some more detail. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us today. As Matt noted in his summary, we are very pleased with our financial performance in the first half of FY20 taking into account we sold a 40% stake in the Victorian Otto Basin in late F FY19. In the first half of FY20, Peach reported $900 million of sales revenue from sales volume of 13.4 million barrels of oil equivalents, which is 3% higher on a pro forma basis if we adjust for the Otto sale. Our own ongoing focus on operating margins saw Peach report first half underlying EBITDA of $622 million an underlying impact of $274 million. First half EBITDA was positively impacted by approximately $25 million relating to the unwind of the latter CSA liabilities, and we expect a similar contribution in the second half. This is a material step down from the prior corresponding period where the unwind of the CSA liabilities contributed almost $19 million to EBITDA. Operating cash inflows of $351 million was a strong outcome considering it included cash tax payments of $238 million. Turning to slide nine, this is a summary of the first half financial highlights compared with the first half of FY19. Key movements between the two periods was driven by the sale of 40% interest in Victorian Otway Basin assets, partly offset by a 4% increase in realized oil prices and a 6% increase in realized gas and ethane prices. As Matt mentioned in his introduction, first half underlying impact was up 9% on a pro forma basis. The balance sheet remains in a very robust position with a reported net cash position of $60 million at the end of the first half, despite high investing activity and the material cash tax payment. Furthermore, the board has approved the payment of an interim dividend of one cent per share to Leaf Bank. Turning to slide 10, this is a breach from first half FY19 underlying impact of $279 million to first half FY20 underlying impact of $274 million. Although impact was broadly unchanged, there were a number of key differences between the periods. Profits were impacted by the Otway sale, higher tolls and royalties associated with our Cooper Basin production and resulting higher tax. This was offset by low net financing costs thanks to the repayment of half a billion dollars of debt and lower depreciation. I also wanted to highlight the financial impact from our adoption of AASB 16 from 1 July 2019, which cover now how leases are treated in our financial statements. In a nutshell, the new standards are an accounting change only with no cash flow impact. Lease payments, which for beach mainly relate to the leasing of drill rigs, offices and helicopters, shifted from operating expenses to depreciation and interest expense. Furthermore, the balance sheet has grossed up with the recognition of a lease asset and liability of around $100 million. There's also an associated positive EBITDA impact of $20 million and broadly offsetting increase in DDNA of $20 million. Further information relating to the impact of AASB 16 on our financials can be found on slide 37 of this presentation. Turning to slide 11, this shows the movement in our net cash position in the first half of FY20. Operating cash flows, excluding tax, was the biggest positive contributor in the first half of FY20 at $589 million. The biggest outflows related to our expanded investment program of $440 million and cash tax payments of $238 million. The cash tax payment in the first half represents the finalization of FY19 tax payments as well as provisional payments for the first half of FY20 for both Australia and New Zealand. We closed the half year with $95 million in cash 
net cash of $60 million and total liquidity of $510 million. To summarize then on slide 12, Beach's balance sheet remains in a very strong position with $60 million net cash and access to over $500 million in liquidity. We believe a strong balance sheet is important for the company as we ex execute on our growth strategy. We believe this to ensure we can weather periods of heightened oil price volatility as challenges such as the coronavirus add further uncertainty to global economic growth. Our net cash position combined with our gas business provides Beach with a natural hedge against this volatility. As we've said before, FY20 gas revenues will cover all of our forecast operating costs and we expect gas revenues will increase in the coming years as we target higher production and benefit from increased exposure to market prices. At Beach, we pride ourselves on our low-cost operator model and our operational excellence program continues to deliver outstanding results. With facility reliability above 98%, and our team continues to op optimize our work programs to maximize facility uptime and reduce costs. Beach is a growth company, and our priority for capital allocation remains growing to total shareholder returns via value accretive growth investments. We are undertaking significant organic reinvestment this year in high returning projects across our portfolio and we continue to screen new opportunities that meet our strict investment criteria. I would now like to hand back to Matt to run through guidance and the assets. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Mornay. Before we update you on our growth projects, I want to run through our updated FY20 guidance, beginning with a summary on slide 14. On the production front, we've narrowed production guidance to 27 to 28 million barrels of oil equivalent and increased capital expenditure guidance to $875 to $950 million. I'll speak to both of these in more detail shortly. Underlying EBITDA guidance has been narrowed to $1.275 to $1.35 billion, partly impacted by the narrowing of production guidance, but also impacted by a sharp reduction in Brent oil price assumptions for the second half of FY20. Underlying EBITDA guidance is positively impacted by the unwinding of liabilities associated with our gas sales agreements to the tune of $50 million, unchanged from prior guidance. CD&A guidance has also been narrowed to $17 to $17.50 per Bowie. Both EBITDA and CD&A are also impacted by the application of AASP 16 accounting standards. Let's move to slide 15. To make things easy for investors and those on the call, we've provided a bridge from first half to second half production. We forecast an increase in second half production relative to the first, driven by a number of factors. These include higher sustained output from our western flank oil assets, contribution from our growth investments outside of the Cooper Basin, a reduced impact from planned maintenance, so that is, we don't have a major shutdown in the second half, and a new gas contract with Alinta Energy at Basgas. Overall, we're extremely pleased with the progress across our asset base. I have no doubt the natural question on your minds is why we're no longer expecting to hit the top end of our prior guidance. And that can really be answered for two reasons. One, customer demand. As is standard in many gas contracts, our customers have a degree of flexibility in any year in terms of the total volume of gas they can nominate. After a very strong year for gas demand in FY19, customer demand has been lower in FY20, likely driven by the availability of lower priced gas primarily out of Queensland. We expect our customers will continue to utilise contract flexibility as spot gas prices move around, but our contracts are underpinned by take or pay obligations and ensure most of our gas available for sale is sold every year. Secondly, black watch timing. The same rig that is drilling the black watch development well in Victoria was used to drill the Hazelgrove 4 and Dombey 1 wells. The duration of those wells was longer than anticipated. We had to deal with strong winds when, with the rig when we arrived in Victoria and we elected to undertake some rig maintenance. Resulting in the rig spudding black watch around two months later than originally anticipated. And fortunately, that means that the Blackwatch well following maintenance has actually performed well. 
So the timing of first gas from Blackwatch has moved from what we'd expected in March 2020 quarter to now being the June quarter. If we move to slide 16, I'm pleased to report that the Beach Energy Board has approved a further increase in investment to support and accelerate our growth activities. As I mentioned earlier, drilling success breeds more opportunities and that creates the need to reinvest in our business. And these include an increase in Western Plains infrastructure investment following the success of the recent development and appraisal drilling activities. Contracting the Eastern Well 106 rig to drill two additional Hazelgrove appraisal wells following our success at Dombey. Long lead items associated with the planned Perth Basin drilling campaign in FY21 following the success at Bahara Springs Deep. Potentially significant Tafaki exploration well currently drilling in New Zealand. And a higher spend by the Cooper Basin Joint Venture, primarily to support the success of higher Western Plains liquids volume through Pork and Iken. And as mentioned a moment ago, the duration of the Hazelgrove 4 and Dombey 1 wells in the FA Otway was longer than initially forecast, resulting in a minor cost overrun. Overall, we now expect to invest between $875 and $950 million in FY20. Almost 84% of this spend is directed at growth investment and more than $500 million is directed toward bringing new gas suppliers to the East Coast gas market. Turn to slide 17. The key focus for Beach in the first half of this year is to continue our appraisal of the Western Plain. Increase oil output through the application of horizontal drilling technology and remove infrastructure bottlenecks. In addition, we've been preparing for further exploration drilling. As we've reported in our quarterlies, a development and appraisal drilling program has once again delivered some outstanding wells. On the production front, first half Western Plank oil output increased by 44% on the prior period to reach 3.4 million barrels. We set the bar high internally to reach this level of production and the team has delivered. The chart on the bottom right of the slide shows how we've doubled oil production from our operated permits over the past 18 months and we're now in excess of 22,000 barrels a day. Overall, we drilled 46 wells at a 72% success rate. We're not concerned by the slightly reduced success rate here as we made a deliberate decision to get more aggressive with our step-out appraiser wells to find the field limits. This means we can now move to harvest mode on our fields more rapidly rather than having to invest more in rounds of appraisal drilling. Our appraisal campaign has identified new development well locations, meaning we can move to optimise oil extraction from our fields. On slide 18, I know we talk a lot about Bowler and the field commands our attention, which just continues to deliver. In the first half of FY20, we completed a second round of appraisal drilling. The map on the left is of the top and Kinlay structure and the field limit before and after the most recent appraisal drilling. What this shows is an extension of the field limit in the northern and southern parts of the field. So what does this mean? It means there, more, there is more structure with oil potential that needs to be drained. It also means that the structural extent of the bow field is still not fully known, and that's a good problem to have. So we need a third phase of appraisal drilling to further understand the structural extent of the bow field. We're planning for this in the third phase in early FY21. In the first half of FY20, we drilled seven horizontal wells in the bow field. We've discussed the benefits of horizontal wells over vertical wells before, and we've had some standout results to date. One well I want to point out is the Bow 39 well, labelled on the map. This well was drilled from west to east and continued drilling while it remained in reservoir. In other words, the horizontal development well also had an appraisal component to it. It's fair to say the lateral section was drilled much further than we'd expected. Drilling over 1,500 metres of McKinlay Reservoir was 90% pay, lifting the southeast portion of the field. The well has been on free flow 
but we anticipate a 30 day initial production rate of over 2,000 barrels of oil a day on pump when it's converted in coming weeks. Go to slide 19. This slide outlines our planned focus areas for the remainder of FY20. One of the two rigs we have operating, operating in the western flank will be dedicated to exploration and appraisal drilling, including two exploration wells, Ellick South and Glenelg North, towards the end of the financial year. It's good to be back drilling western flank oil exploration wells, and we expect to drill a number of additional prospects in FY21 and beyond. Our other rig will be dedicated to development drilling to maximise our oil production from XL91 and 92 as long as possible. This will see 10 Bauer lateral wells drilled in the second half. As we outlined earlier, to support our higher forward volume, we'll invest a further $30 million into more artificial lift and surface infrastructure. Turn to slide 20, which outlines our western flank gas business. Operationally, we've had a very solid first half with production up 8% on the prior corresponding period. As you know, we produce very liquids rich gas from our western flank fields. So we remain focused on optimising liquids production through the Middleton gas processing facility. In fact, our average liquids content is 50 barrels a million per standard gap from the Lowry wells. And we've tied in during the first half of FY20. We have a number of development and appraisal wells we can drill in XL 106, as well as five planned exploration wells in XL 107. Our aim is to keep the Middleton facility full for longer while optimising liquids production and evaluate the potential expansion subject to exploration and appraisal results. Go to slide 21. The Cooper Basin Joint Venture has had a very strong year with the drill bit, with Beach participating in 53 wells at a 92% success rate. The joint venture enjoyed some really encouraging exploration success in southwest Queensland in the first half. A recent well, Leghorn 1, recently came online at 12 million standard cubic feet of gas per day on a 30% choke. As we've mentioned in our guidance section, Operator Santos has outlined plans for increased maintenance costs, which is largely directed at Port Nyton, given the high liquid sales we have out of the Cooper particularly from the western flank. We're a big believer in the oil potential in this joint venture acreage, and we're pleased to say that the venture is planning to drill up to 29 oil wells in the second half of FY20. Slide 22. Over in the west, it's been a very exciting and busy first half of the year for Beach. At Waits here, we reached FID, as you know, for stage one expansion, which will increase output from 10 TJs a day to 20 TJs a day when it's completed in early FY21. As a reminder, that also means we'll be fully connected to the Bampi to Bunbury pipeline from early FY21. We know that you've been very patient waiting for news on Waits here stage two. We're also obviously aware there's been a lot of speculation in the press surrounding potential commercialised out outcomes for Waits here. And I do risk disappointing you today when I say I'm not going to be discussing commercialisation plans until we have firm agreements in place with the relevant counterparties. However, I will trot out the old line again, you only get to sell the gas once. And we're being patient, ensuring that we maximise value for our shareholders. And I'll say again, all options are on the table. As commercialisation discussions continue, we haven't been sitting still with feed activities and the EPC tender process now complete. All this is predicated on the joint venture led by our operator Mitsui reaching FID. We continue to target FID on stage two by the end of FY20. Let's go to slide 23. You probably know by now the Kingia formation is turning out to be a very prolific play in the Perth Basin. To date, there have been three valid tests of the Kingia formation in the basin, running at a 100% success rate. In the first half of FY20, we drilled the Pahara Springs Deep Exploration Well, which flow tested at up to 46 million standard cubic feet of gas per day over a 225 minute interval 
on a tubing constrained test. To put that in context, the reservoir potential is similar to that that we've seen at weights year three and weights year four, which flowed at higher rates on test with a larger diameter tubing. As you heard earlier, we've moved quickly to secure a rig to drill additional follow-up exploration and appraisal wells subject to JB approval. We commenced the acquisition of the TRIAD 3D seismic survey, which is designed to high grade some exploration targets for future drilling. We plan to have interpretations ready in the first half of FY21. The joint venture is considering further seismic acquisition in the future to ensure most of our acreage is covered for high quality 3D. Slide 24, moving back to the east. We've talked about Blackwatch, where drilling is underway, and we've already reached the 5,500 metre mark and plan to total measure depths of 7,200 metres. The rig drilling Blackwatch will move to the Enterprise location for Enterprise Exploration Well after Blackwatch is complete, and drilling should be underway in the June 2020 quarter. The Oceanonic Semi Sub is scheduled to arrive in Victoria in March for its nine well campaign. We will begin with the Artisan Exploration Well, which will be drilled ahead of our Geograph and Thylacine development wells. As we outlined at our site visit in September last year, these are the first wells to be drilled in our Victorian acreage for more than five years. Our goal is to refill the Otway gas plant to its full capacity with the lowest unit technical cost gas and keep it full for as long as possible. So the journey is now well and truly underway. On slide 25, we summarise the results from the Dombey One well in the South Australian Otway Basin. More work needs to be done to determine the field size and commerciality, so we're considering a 3D seismic over the area. As we touched on earlier, we have secured a rig to return to the Hazelgrove field shortly to complete testing on the Hazelgrove 4 well and drill a further appraisal well. I'm very pleased to announce that the new 10 terajoule a day Catnook gas plant is now officially up and running, with first gas sales achieved from the facility this week. The gas processing facility was partly funded by a federal gap grant and adds a new source of gas supply to the local community. To jump to slide 26, we touch on our progress in the Bass Basin, with a recent Wylon program adding around 19 million standard cubic feet of gas per day. Meanwhile, progress continues on Trefoil Concept Select and planning is underway to acquire 3D seismic over the nearby gas discovery. On slide 27, another really good six months operationally in New Zealand. The highlight, as I've said a number of times, being the two-pay shutdown and the subsequent class ramp up to pre-shutdown levels thereafter. The joint venture has approved a reperforation opportunity which, if successful, should increase output ahead of completion of the compression project currently underway. And last but not least, on slide 28 and 29, we touch on our Frontier Exploration Program. As we announced in December, each farmed into the high impact Tafaki Exploration Well in the Great South Basin in New Zealand. For approximately $25 million investment, each has a 30% interest in the well, which is targeting a 470 square kilometre undrilled exploration prospect. Drilling commenced in January, and we anticipate a result before the end of the month. In around 12 months' time, we expect to be back in New Zealand drilling the Werry prospect. Each is operator, and planning is going well. On slide 29, you see the Ironbark prospect, which is on track to commence drilling by operator BT towards the end of calendar 2020. This very large undrilled structure sits out the back of gas fields supplying the North West Shelf, and it targets the same reservoirs as those in production at Gorgon. So within 18 months, Beach is participating in three high impact exploration wells. If you look at slide 30, you'll see a summary of our current planned rig activity over the next 18 months, showing an increasing level of rig activity outside of the Cooper Basin. In short, it's an exciting time to be at beach. Slide 31, it shows our updated well count that we expect to complete in FY20. 
which is largely unchanged from our prior guidance. All up, we expect to participate in around 191 wells this year, including nine outside of the Cooper. So you've seen a lot of slides, let's close out on slide 32. Today's key takeaways. The eight messages I want to leave you with are, one, the business is in excellent shape and we're executing very well on our growth program. Two, from an operational perspective, we're operating our assets at target reliability levels and completing our major shutdown activities such as coupe on time, on budget and safely. Three, we had a very busy six months with the drill bits, completing 105 wells at an 83% success rate. Four, we've had success on the exploration and appraisal front at Bower, Sahara Springs Deep and Dombey. And we're moving quickly to a follow up on all three results. Five, we forecast higher production levels in the second half of FY20 as we start to see contribution from our growth activities in our asset base. Six, we're in for a very busy 12 months with the drill pits as we move to drill important wells in Victoria, South Australia, Western Australia and New Zealand. Seven, Waitsia Stage 2 has made good progress and we continue to target a final investment decision by the end of this financial year. Eight, our strong balance sheet position combined with stable cash flows from our gas business give us confidence to increase investment to support and accelerate our growth. So that marks the end of today's presentation and I'd like to open up the lines now for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question today, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request at any time, please press the pound or hash key. Your first question today comes from the line of James Byrne from City. Please go ahead. Good morning, Matt. Um, my first question is around the Western Flank infrastructure investment. I think the market and certainly us at City attributed volume growth with the successful appraisal drilling, but perhaps have been a bit blindsided by the associated step up in CapEx to handle the additional fluid. The IRRs that have been quoted to the market in the past were very high, and I'm wondering whether they in fact included that CapEx or not. And I also wondered about whether, uh, you know, your, your message is effectively to the market of strong free cash flow generation in future years. So why did you choose to not disclose to the market the price tag associated with success like this? And can I perhaps afford you the opportunity now to disclose any further capex increases associated with similar successes in the near future? Yeah, sure. And I have to answer the question. Look, I think the answer here is we've had a very successful period on the western flank, and it does continue to surprise us on the upside. I think if you look at the chart that we showed where we've literally doubled production in the western flank in the last 18 months, that's a really strong outcome for us. <coughs> what that naturally drives though is further investment, um, both from a subsurface perspective and a surface perspective to maintain that production and obviously evacuate it out to market. So yes, there is more capex than we had initially expected, but that's part of the fact that we're actually getting better results as well than we initially expected. So it's success breeding more capex, if you like. In terms of the rates of return, the rates of return are so high here uh, when we're talking in the hundreds of percent um, that that additional $30 million of capital really doesn't make a, a dent in it whatsoever, frankly. Um, so these are still incredibly high returning assets. And the answer is they're really easy investment decisions for us because they are high returning and it is growing the business in a way that we couldn't find anywhere else in the world, frankly. Got it. All right. Um, look, perhaps I'm nitpicking here, but I note the drilling costs and schedule overruns in Victoria and the associated black watch delay. I can see they're small in dollar terms in the context of the overall CapEx budget, but nonetheless, I would have thought they were relatively straightforward wells to have drilled.
my question here is just trying to understand from you what controls you have in place to ensure that the organisational capacity exists to execute on what's effectively you know, a record capex program, and particularly in the context of the upcoming offshore drilling. Do you think that, in, that uh, investors should be quite comfortable with your ability to execute? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think investors should be very comfortable. You know, we, we have said and we explained it in some detail that our site visit to the Otway but we now have all the seats full in terms of the capability and capacity that we need to execute our capital program. And um, investors who intended, uh, attended that session got a chance to meet a number of those individuals. So we're very comfortable with the team. The, the issues around um, the drilling um, cost overruns, obviously we had success at Bombay, which creates an extended period for us. Um, when we took the rig across to um, Victoria, we had very, a very high wind period, so we lost just over a week in terms of high winds. We've also had side tracks on those wells that we've been performing in the South Australian Otway at Dombey as well. So that extends the period of time that we were drilling. Um, and I would say, obviously, with Blackwatch, that is a very large well. That's a 7,000 metre well. So what we wanted to make sure was that rig was absolutely ready from a maintenance perspective to conduct that. There's probably a little bit more maintenance than we'd expected, but we're pleased we've done it because since that rig has been uh, drilling, it's performed very well. Got it. Okay, last question from me. Just in terms of the gas in Victoria, let's suppose that volumes disappoint or you didn't have success with the drill bit at Enterprise or Artisan. I was hoping you could help us understand at what point your revenues aren't going to cover the high fixed costs there at your infrastructure. Um, I, I don't necessarily expect you to indulge me in what your provisions assume in terms of abandonment timing, um, but just helping us understand the risk there that if, if there was disappointment, at what point does it no longer make sense to keep that plan operating? Uh, gee, we're a very, very long way away from that type of discussion and decision, frankly, we're a mile off of it. Um, so obviously we have a large campaign coming up with an 11 well program, the vast majority of those wells are development wells, which means they're relatively low risk. I said low risk, not no risk, but they're relatively low risk wells. Um, the exploration wells are relatively low risk for exploration. Obviously, again, not no risk, but low risk. So we're very comfortable with our program there. I'd also flag that we have told the market that the vast majority of our CapEx this year is targeting more than 50, 5.8% rates to return, that obviously includes the Otway CapEx. So it's certainly a long, long, long way from being marginal. So at the moment, we're very comfortable with the program we have and the amount of gas we think we're expecting to get. So we're certainly not in a wind down position on Otway, not even close. Great, all right, they're very good answers. Thanks, Matt, appreciate it. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Ben Wilson from Royal Bank of Canada. Please go ahead. Uh, g'day, Matt. Um, I just had a couple of questions about your uh, Tafaki well in, in New Zealand. Uh, good pronunciation, by the way. Um, one on, uh, are you going to put target size or pre-drill estimates on it? I see your JV or your operator has mentioned you know, some very big numbers overall in the block, but just not sure about this prospect um, specifically. And secondly, uh, is there anything you've seen that gives you comfort um, that it might be liquids um, rather than gas, which is more prone in the area. And lastly, I just saw, a, a, uh, I guess, a snafu on the on the BOP, whether that's factored into your um, cost estimates for the well yet. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, I have to answer all, all three. So look, this is a, a basin that we've known for a long time. Um, Tafaki, we've been looking at for around nine months. So we understand it uh, reasonably well. No, we're not going to give you uh, pre-drill volumetrics, but I think when we say that the mapped closure is 470 square kilometres, that's a fairly good indication that this is a potentially very, very large opportunity. Um, we think it's probably more liquids prone, but obviously the drill bits will tell us that. We're not that far away. In terms of fumes that we had on the rig, um, so they test blowout preventers and the blowout preventers tripped. So it's good to know that they work. There was no risk whatsoever at the time to any of the individuals on the rig, and there was absolutely no risk to the environment as well. So it's good to know that the BOPs work, albeit we'd prefer they didn't trip. That'll probably 
and this is ballpark numbers, cost us in the order of an extra circa $2 million up the stakes at the end of the day, but still early days, we're still working through that. Okay, that, that's great. And, and just lastly, does, does a gas discovery you know, represent a, a, a failure or given it's the scale of the closure, you're, you're thinking is there potential given of it as gas? Given the size of the closure, we'd be happy with any discovery. Okay, that's great. Good luck. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Your next question comes on the line of Sam Semter from MST. Please go ahead. Close. That must be my, my brother. I've got um, three questions if I uh, can. Matt, first one on the, um, the $20 million of uh, extra maintenance spend that uh, has surprised you guys, at least it seems, from Santos's operator. I mean, Santos have been definitive for the last couple of years, and they reiterated this guidance twice in the last uh, two months, that they're spending $300 million US in the Cooper Basin. Actually, to be honest, when you look at their numbers, and I get these things aren't perfectly linear in the last two quarters, first half 20 for you, they spent uh, about 65% of that four-year number. Uh, so I'm just curious why this number has come as a surprise to you. Should, should the inference be that you would be <coughs> assuming less than Santos's guidance that they've been given to some stage? Um, no, look, Mark, I wouldn't call it necessarily a, a surprise. The issue is the differential in timing between um, us being on a financial year and Santos being on a calendar year. So that means the timing that we receive their budget process is obviously different to the timing of our budget process, and obviously our market guidance comes out of our budget process. So this is new definition that we've had through the Santos um, budgeting process. Uh, we support the spend. And frankly, as we mentioned, a lot of it is driven around Port Bonison at the fact of we've been so successful in terms of not only out of the basin, but particularly the western flank of how much oil we're delivering. So that means we need more maintenance, particularly at Port Bonison. But for Santos, I mean, Santos told us numerous times the last couple of years they've spent $300 million a year for the next five years. That's not strange. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand if you had been assuming previously lower. Uh, so so our, our, our guidance comes out of the definitive budget process, which it has to. So it's the budget process which leads to joint venture approvals and obviously then leads to the AFE process. Okay, and I guess um, moving on to guidance, you've given historical analysis as not the uh, free cash flow guidance charts in this presentation anymore. When we think about FY21, uh, obviously you've got way maintenance in there, maybe some hot wave drillings drifted into there too. Uh, I know you're not going to say much on the uh, the Lassus reopener, or obviously you could talk about the risk group going to arbitration as well, but I mean, yeah, unequivocally, Victorian prices have, contract prices have come off since you gave that guidance. Uh, under the same macro assumptions, do you still wanting to stand by your $200 million free cash flow guidance for FY21? We'll, we'll come out with an update on our five year outlook in August in a more definitive way. I wouldn't agree with you in relation to the Victorian gas pricing perspective. There is a strong differential between spot pricing and term contracts in terms of delivery tenure and delivery locations. I certainly wouldn't agree in terms of softening on uh, longer term contracts. Do you so that for us... I know you, sorry, Matt, interrupt you, but so you, you, I mean, you put up in the last couple of presentations the average $9.71 PHRC closes historically. You, you don't believe contract prices have come off at all? Because I guess, I mean, everything I hear certainly says, uh, I completely agree that spot's not the same as contracts, but uh, certainly everything I've heard suggests that yeah, so, contract so, prices so, have softened. So we don't quote a specific number. What we do is point to the ranges that the ACCC uses. And as I've said many times, we don't use those numbers in terms of our future guidance. We use bottom ends of ranges when there are ranges in the market. So that's what we've guided to towards previously. Uh, okay. okay, and um, I mean, just sorry, just while I'm on the free cash flow guidance number for FY20, uh, obviously by the time we get to the result that have already happened, uh, we've obviously got the extra capex. Have there been any changes in your guys' view of the operating cash flow that previously underpinned the FY20 free cash flow guidance, or should we effectively just lob the extra capex off that number? I think the issue at the moment is any, obviously, cash flow guidance is dependent upon many factors. It's going to depend upon what happens with oil price, which we've seen come off pretty rapidly as a result of the That's coronavirus. On, on guidance, not, not changing macro assumptions. You provided the guidance on a set of macro assumptions. So same assumption. 
sorry, what we, what we give to the market is what the, the numbers are that we're using in our guidance. What actually will eventuate over the course is obviously there's many metrics that will impact. Coronavirus obviously wasn't in our forecast, so there'll be an impact around oil pricing, uh, dependent on how plants perform going forward. So what we do is we disclose to the market what numbers we've used to come up with those guidance numbers. Obviously then up to others to determine what they think the actual numbers will be, and there's obviously many changing and pivotal points. Yeah, so yeah, we won't go into it. I was asking for if it fit under the same assumptions, but we'll we'll move on then. Just last question, if I can. Um, you spoke about lower customer nominations this year. Uh, as we look and think about that price rate, now obviously customer nominations as a lever your buyer has to pull. Can you give us a feel for this year how how close to the uh, the maximum downward nominations they can make they've been, or if uh, is there much more flex for them to nominate? lower if uh, I guess if they're not happy with the pricing outcome or? No, unfortunately as you know Mark I can't disclose um, the details of the sales contracts and if I was to do that I'd be disclosing the details within the contract so unfortunately I can't. Okay, uh, thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Adam Martin from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Um, uh, morning, Matt. Uh, Mornay, just back on the uh, sort of CapEx question, obviously there's an increase. How, how much of that CapEx is timing? So how much does that impact the, the 21 CapEx numbers that you've put out there previously? And also, you know, what extra do you get, if any, on that five-year forecast in, in, regards, in regards to production? Or is, uh... Yeah, morning. It's a, it's a good question. Um, the majority of it is incremental, and it's because of the success that we've had. So if you recall, our five-year um, planning assumptions, we didn't assume any exploration success other than risk volumes out of the Cooper and also out of the Otway. So therefore, the discovery that we've had in the Perth Basin and the discovery that we've had in the SA Otway is incremental. It's a great news outcome. Tafaki um, is obviously incremental as well, um, and the bulk of the Western Flank and therefore associated uh, Port Penice and CapEx is incremental, but obviously what you're getting from that is we're getting more volumes through the western flank, which, are, as I said earlier, are incredibly high returning volumes, so that'll pay out very quickly. So so we should what, see uh, higher production come through is that in August. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, correct. So, so I don't want to state exact volumes and numbers. So obviously we're working through a five-year planning process right now, but what I am saying is the benefit of some of that additional spend has come from new discoveries that were not in the previous five-year outlook. So yes, there'll be benefits coming from those new discoveries. Okay, that's good. Um, second question, just on um, costs. Um, if I look at your slide five, you know, the cost sort of momentum seems to be slowing a bit. Um, those costs obviously exclude various things. If I just look at your accounts, costs are actually up a bit based on sort of, you know, how, how I work it on a per BOE basis. But what's your sort of sense in terms of where you actually are on the cost out phase? Is it sort of coming to an end? Can you just give us a bit of insight there, please? Uh, thanks, Adam. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, just from an overall field operating uh, cost point of view, obviously on that side, uh, you see the great outcome from the underlying uh, operational uh, um, operational work that the, that the guys have been doing in terms of reducing the cost there. From an overall perspective, you, you see that what's playing in there is the, the overall product mix. So we got more oil obviously flowing from the western flank, and with that carries more uh, tolls and tariffs that come with that. But obviously, that comes with its higher revenue and then higher margin, uh, higher margin volumes as well. Uh, so I suppose although you see an uptick in the overall costs, uh, they relate to driving higher margins and, and uh, higher cash flow from that from, from those volumes as well. Okay, no, that's good. And then um, final question, probably back from Matt, just, just regarding um, this, you know, sort of origin repricing, obviously global gas prices are low, domestic price has been high, it's starting to come down. Um, when, when are we going to get a sense of when that's actually concluded by and when will we be able to actually sort of see what price, you know, comes through the portfolio in terms of quarterlies or whenever else? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Obviously global prices don't directly impact um, the reopener, nor do spot prices, as I mentioned earlier, but I can't give you too much details on it. What I can tell you is the ball has started rolling 
if he were to go through an arbitration process, I suspect full park, that would be more than six months to, to undertake. Um, and the result then gets backdated to the uh, required date in the contract. So we'll keep the market updated at material change points. Um, we're not intending to do every dance move, but obviously when it's material, we'll keep the market informed. All right, perfect. That's all for me, thanks. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Saul Kavanick from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi, gents. Uh, three questions, if I may. Uh, and sorry if I'm repeating earlier questions, but just uh, a bit more clarity. On the increase in CapEx we saw, and I'm talking specifically about Western Flank Cooper Basin um, numbers, just to, to reiterate, is this going to result in an increase in production beyond the original, the, the five year target that you set last year, or is this an incremental CapEx? just going to be there to meet the same target? Yes, so I think, you know, obviously we will guide properly to um, revising the five-year outlook. We're working through our five-year plans right now. What I can say is um, from a general point of view, the performance of the western flank drilling this year has exceeded our expectations. So we now have to work through what that means for reserves and we've got to work through what it means for production. So um, I can't guide too much until we've done all the work, but at the moment what I'm saying is they are positive outcomes. And as I've said earlier, these are relatively modest numbers compared to the types of returns we're getting off of the Western Flank. All right, thanks. Uh, on the production guidance being the 27 to 28 million barrels, now that's obviously now after, I'll just check that there, that's after deferring the Otway maintenance into the next financial year. So, I mean, just on some rough numbers I do, on a pro forma basis, that suggests that guidance would be, you know, 26 and a half to 27 and a half. Um, why is it, I mean, my question is, why is it so low if, you know, a couple months delay at Blackwatch um, and lower customer nominations, was, those, was that something not originally considered within the original guidance range? Yeah, I think that the main issue is around, um, you know, two areas we pointed to is one is the delay of Blackwatch. The other area that we pointed to is nominations. So they they are the two key drivers. I think your numbers might seem a bit bit high on on the other adjustment. But if you want to take that offline with Nick, I think he can probably give you a bit more discussion on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, and just lastly, moving to the Perth base, and we've always had the really good Harris Springs results. Um, can you just perhaps outline what the drivers are for spending additional exploration capex there in the near term, just given the amount of reserves you've already got at Wait CR and the time there still is to go there on developing that? Uh, what's the driver of doing that capex spend now, as opposed to waiting for a few years? Um, I think you'd only do that capex spend solo if you were very confident of commercialisation in the basin, and we're very confident of commercialisation of our gas in the basin. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. That's it for me. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of James Redfern from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi Matt, um, James here. Um, just, just two questions for me, please. Um, just going back to the uh, Torhaki Tor well in New Zealand, um, it's a high impact well, so I'm just, just wondering what your um, internal probability of success is for that well. We're we talking like, you know, you know, what, one, in, one in five probability of success, and I've just got one more on weights here after that, please. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk rough, rough here and try not to get kicked under the table by uh, the head of exploration sitting next to me. Um, I think we've been pretty clear in the market that we're not a company that targets 1 in 10, 1 in 15 wells, that we prefer um, 1 in 4 wells or better. Um, so you can expect it's in that sort of range. Um, obviously what that means is there is more likelihood that it will be dry than not. So this is exploration, so we've got to be realistic. But it's an incredibly large structure. So uh, that's what's driven us towards this point. And we know the Basin well, like I said, we've done about nine months of work on, on this opportunity for Faki. Okay, great, thank you. And then just just, just on weights this stage too, I understand you made the comments that you, you can't provide a lot of detail at the moment, but just, just in terms of what's been publicly announced, just, um, if you could please remind me. So we're, we're talking about a potential project of between 100 and 250 TJs a day. And I guess the size of the facility or the project will depend on how much gas you can sell at, 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 at appropriate prices. Um, 
Is that correct? That's, so that we're still talking that, that, that wide range there depending on the end market uh, demand, is that right? Yeah, correct. So that's what we've done all of our engineering studies on and, and progressed towards. So we're ready to move very quickly uh, once we hit green light points at FID. And the other point I'd obviously note is um, that phase one uh, expansion includes interconnection to the Dampier to Bunbury natural gas pipeline, which is important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I guess what we're really waiting on is is is, is for Beach to announce some some um, uh, binding or, or I guess heads of agreement um, gas sales agreements for possibly 200 250 a day, and then and then and then that also sort of be a segue into the FID for 250 a day. And I guess the only market, the only customer who could take that would be potentially the Northwest Shelf if they were happy to buy your gas and then, and then send it offshore as LNG. Would that be fair? Yeah, so as I, as I said, we'll disclose more once we're at binding points in any discussions that we're currently having, and we're having multiple discussions. Okay, uh, very good. Okay, Matt, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Daniel Butcher from CLSA. Please go ahead. Uh, hi guys, look, uh, James, we have a red hot go on weights here, so I won't try again on that one. Um, just curious on the Cooper Basin capex, especially the 30 million in the western flank. I know you answered the question this before, but um, is some of that cost increase for water handling attributable to higher water cut on the existing production base? And can you maybe just remind us about what the water cut is in in the sort of existing fields and where it's trending to at the moment? Yeah, it's uh, Jeff Parker here. Um, basically. Um, we're currently r- running uh, at about uh, 90% water cut overall in the western flank. Um, so we're not seeing any change in that trend. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, better than expected success from the drilling results that we've had that have required additional infrastructure to handle the production. So, uh, you know, it's a good news story. Uh, and relatively speaking, compared to the total investment that's being made in the western flank, those uh, uh, expansion costs, the facilities expansion costs are very minor. And does your modelling anticipate a, a much larger increase in that in, in the near term or medium term? In terms well, of water current, as, as No, no, well, basically uh, we are in an area with strong water drive fields. So uh, the, 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 the baseline production uh, will continue to have a, a, an increase in water cut but we're replacing that with new uh, low water cut wells all the time. That's the objective of the drilling program. Okay, thanks. Um, and just, just finally, uh, most of my questions were asked, but just, just on, on Blackwatch, obviously it had a significant impact on your, your guidance. I'm wondering whether you could disclose what sort of initial production rate you're assuming in your guidance for that well. No, we haven't disclosed initial rates uh, to the market. I think you can probably calculate from the, the amount of period that we've talked about. Right, yeah. Um, and maybe a final question, just on, uh, you know, you've obviously got a lot of organic opportunities on your plate. Um, if oil stays at 55 rather than recovering to sort of 60, 65, does that put a, uh, does that sort of take M&A off the cards for, for the near term, or are you still open to that, given your cash flow uh, impact of, of where oil prices are right now? I think what would flag is, you know, we're a highly robust company, given um, the amount of gas business that we have in our portfolio now. So our gas business, as we've mentioned previously, covers the totality of our operating costs as a business. So we're highly robust, we've got high rates of return on all of our assets, including our gas assets. So that means we're able to spend. It also means if the right opportunities arise, we're able to take a good look at them, particularly when we're sitting net cash today. So. Uh, volatility is something that we're comfortable with because we've got a business that can handle it really well. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I would now like to hand the conference back to today's presenters. Please continue. I think that closes us out, so I appreciate everyone's time and obviously please feel free to uh, follow up with Nick and the team in relation to any further questions you have and for those that we're going to see on the road in the next couple of days, look forward to catching up. Thank you. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.